So just to introduce myself, my name is Simon Erich. I'm a junior doctor based in NHS in the UK. I'm also a clinical research fellow based at Imperial. Um, but my prim primary role and the reason why I'm here is that I'm the head of research and access at cannabis um, at Sapphire Medical Clinics, which is a UK based medical cannabis clinic. And I'm really happy uh, to be joined today by three uh, eminent experts in terms of sleep medicine and the research and clinical activities that go on in this space. And hopefully we'll have a really interesting uh, hour or so going through some of their recent findings and then also uh, open up at the end to a little bit of a discussion as well. So first of all, to introduce uh, our first speaker, who will be uh, Professor Ron Grunstein. He's the Professor of Sleep Medicine at the University of Sydney and the lead of the Sleep and Circadian Research Group at the Wilcock Institute. And he's also the, the principal investigator on the CAN Sleep trial. We also have uh, Dr. Jen Walsh, who's also joining us from Australia. Uh, she is a lecturer at the Centre for Sleep Science in the School of Human Sciences at the University of Western Australia, a research fellow at the West Australian Sleep Disorders Research Institute, and was the first author on the recent trial on the ZTL INS 201 uh, product, which is uh, a mouthful to say the least, uh, investigating medical cannabis in insomnia. And finally, uh, we'll have Dr. Mark Weatherall, uh, a consultant neurologist based uh, in, has a uh, practice in the UK in, within the NHS, but also at Sapphire Medical Clinics, treating patients with medical cannabis for a range of neurological conditions. Um, including treatment resistant insomnia. Um, now, before I pass on to uh, Professor Grunstein to, to introduce his first talk, um, just have to give a quick medical disclaimer that anything that we discuss here today does not constitute medical advice and is not a substitute for um, seeking that medical advice through a trained healthcare professional. Um, and so without further ado, uh, Professor Grunstein, do you want to um, load up your slides, please? Okay. okay. I'll, I'll minimize all our faces. Um, yeah, so. This is uh, our institute in, in uh, Sydney with a background of the, the city of Sydney. And we have a sort of broad interest in respiratory disorders and sleep disorders. And uh, um, one of aspects of this is we, we treat and manage a lot of patients with insomnia and uh, you know, have a research program in that area, some of which relates to the topic today. Um, my only conflict of interest is that we have a study where we've received research funds from a company called BOD Australia, which I'll explain a little bit later. So just to start with sort of where we're at, we uh, you know, sort of formed a group to, to do a systematic review of, of really preclinical and clinical studies regarding cannabinoid therapies and the management of all um, sleep disorders. Um, and this is published in Sleep Medicine Reviews uh, last year. And, um, you know, it's a fairly extensive sort of document. But what it highlighted really was um, the relative uh, paucity of information and, and also the, I guess, fair to say, the quality of the research uh, being limited in this area. Uh, though, um, as you'll hear today, there are some <clears throat> promising uh, possibilities uh, coming out through current and, and future research. Um, I'm, I'm not a, an expert on cannabinoid sort of uh, psychopharmacology or, or phys, you know, sort of um, neurotransmitters, etc. cetera. Um, my background is as a, a sleep physician. Um, so one of the, the is issues is that most of the research is focused on effects of illicit cannabis and in, in sort of heavy cannabis users. Um, there's been a fairly limited amount of research um, on, say, for example, CBD. Um, one paper, you know, selected patients who are healthy 
uh, individuals. So one of the other problems I'd highlight is the lack of data in people uh, with insomnia. Um, there are um, several pain studies which have suggested that um, Sativex uh, can improve sleep quality in patients with chronic pain, uh, but there's little objective sleep measurement in those studies. So in our review, we, we, we kind of um, found problems in limited clinical cohorts that had been studied, the limited use of objective measures of sleep and the limited use of validated subjective measures of sleep. And I, I think that um, my following speaker, Jen Walsh, will uh, highlight this in, in really what is the study with probably the best evidence to date um, for uh, the value of cannabinoids in patients with insomnia. Um, this is a table and there's what, what's called a hypnogram up the top, which looks at the different sleep stages and that, you know, they're all in, in different colors. Um, but basically um, these are the, uh, what's known about the um, effects of THC. And as you can see that um, there are some studies that, and, and most, again, most of this data is, uh, been often collected in, in sort of healthy individuals rather than patients with uh, insomnia. But you can see here there's, there's differences between the dosage and there are obviously going to be individual effects. And there's also effects in, in chronic heavy users, uh, withdrawal effects, disturbing sleep. In fact, there was a paper today uh, was published, uh, one of the British Medical Journal Associated um, uh, journals uh, related to pain where they showed that uh, um, both insomnia and hypersomnia are associated with um, uh, heavy cannabis use so and and, uh, and and causing you know clinical problems in in both situations um, I won't talk about sleep apnea because it's really not the topic of, uh, but there have been claims made about dronabinol uh, and a positive uh, randomized controlled trial. But when you look at the study, it's been heavily criticized because there were uh, impressive baseline differences between the active and placebo groups. Um, it led to widespread use in one US state uh, and that caused alarm because people started stopping CPAP and other effective therapies in response to the, the media attention this study drew. And the American Academy of Sleep Medicine strongly advocated caution and came out with a, a policy statement. So at this stage, I can't say that there is, um, you know, there's certainly um, some, su some suggestion that there may be effects, but these findings have not been replicated. What we see, however, is a tremendous amount of information on the internet, advertising, so forth, Instagram, all this sort of stuff about um, CBD or or um, different oils and different sort of combinations and different companies. Um, but these are essentially operating really in the absence of high quality uh, evidence. Um, and they've been of obviously the countermeasures where people have uh, also uh, sort of got publicity on online saying that well, CBD uh, is no panacea for what ails us um, and is uh, ineffective. So there, there is this sort of confusion out there for patients. In Australia, um, there are different levels of what's called scheduling. Um, so if a product has THC greater than 2%, it's Schedule 8 and needs a specific type of prescription and permission by the doctor. A Schedule 4 is like a standard script, that, you know, same for antihypertensives, and you can do that for a 98% pure CBD, but you do need to get approval uh, from the Therapeutic Goods Administration for any, any uh, prescription. So if you look at sleep disorders, the overwhelming use uh, of uh, cannabinoids uh, in patients with sleep disorders is in insomnia. Um, we've been um, collaborating with colleagues at the University of Sydney who um, formed the Lambert Initiative for Cannabinoid Therapeutics. It's headed by a psychopharmacologist, Ian McGregor, um, uh, and was made possible by a donation by philanthropists who had a grandchild with Dravet syndrome, uh, which had responded to um, 
uh, cannabinoid medication. Um, so the Lambert is, is doing extensive preclinical and clinical research, and they seek out collaborators, in our case, the, uh, our, you know, our sleep expertise to, to do trials. The CanSleep trial um, was meant to have finished about a year ago, but um, there's this thing called COVID, which has turned clinical research into a nightmare. Uh, we've now completed the study, but we unfortunately, um, I can't present any results uh, of the study, but I need to explain to you what it is. Um, it's, it's a randomized placebo controlled crossover trial of um, a oral formulation of CBD THC in a 20 to one sort of uh, um, combination. Um, it, there's a, it's one, one night with a drug, one night with a placebo, um, and it's funded by this uh, philanthropic uh, initiative. Um, we only just completed the final participants following the lifting of our sort of lockdown, um, and we should have the results uh, sort of available by hopefully end of January. The study is really a, a fairly unique study, and I'll go through the design in a minute, but it involves what's known as high density EEG. So when you look at sleep, um, you can measure things by questionnaires, you can measure uh, by actigraphy or activity monitoring with actigraphs or even some of these wearable, um, other wearable devices. You can do standard sleep studies, which usually involve anywhere from four to 12 channels of EEG. And you can even look at the EEG in, in, in great detail, micro sort of structure of sleep using quantitative, quantitative EEG. High density EEG is a, is a sort of leap into the, the, the sort of beyond, like sometimes I think it's almost like jumping over a cliff, but um, it involves measuring um, 256 uh, channels, up to 256 channels. And therefore you get a very detailed regional look at the brain um, and, and that's quite important. And so when you, um, <clears throat> people have done this uh, during sleep, you can see, in patients with in, in, insomnia, and they're still fairly small studies, but uh, areas of wakefulness in the sleeping brain and usually fast uh, EEG activity, which is characteristic of insomnia. So our hypothesis is that if um, this combination has an effect on sleep, we should see it by a reduction in both global and regional fast EEG activity. Um, we uh, study the patients in our, our sleep lab. They have an MRI scan, which allows us to uh, sort of localize things much better with the high density EEG. Um, we uh, are also looking at, at, at morning effects, um, including being stimulated uh, in the patients. We're also doing a study, which we're just uh, commencing um, which is really a large scale study and it's entirely or, or virtually entirely online because we don't wanna get caught with our pants down you know, after COVID last year. And it's an eight week randomized controlled trial of a relatively low dose of, of CBD. And the reason for this dosage is that the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia has basically said, if you guys can show us that some you know 150 or or any low dose of CBD uh, is has some effect in patients with insomnia will allow it to be over the counter that is available without a doctor's prescription uh, with the guidance of a of a pharmacist and so a number of companies are doing studies uh, fairly similar this is the I think is the largest and there'll be a lot of questionnaires actigraphy but we've because of the size and the cost, we won't be doing any, any sleep studies as part of this. It'll be simply driven, and the primary variable of interest is uh, insomnia uh, severity index, which um, Jen will explain a little bit later with her study. Um, the other areas that we're looking at, we're uh, about to submit to ethics a study on uh, insomnia and CBN, cannabinol. 
Um, we're also in a similar situation with restless leg syndrome, which is a, can cause insomnia in most patients. And we have an extensive interest in the effects of these drugs on driving, and that's run by a, a postdoc called Danielle McCartney. Um, so in summary, the research agenda that I think we need to sort of focus on is, is utilise validated objective and subjective measures of sleep uh, outcomes to assess the therapeutic efficacy of cannabinoids. Um, we need to have robust study designs um, and they need to be uh, done in people with the disorder. So we need to study people with insomnia, not just uh, translate findings from healthy volunteers. Um, there are, sorry, possibilities of, um, uh, you know, adjunctive treatment of cannabinoids. There's lots of things that we can consider in combining them with, with other medication and looking at safety. Um, also, if we're going to look at THC, we need to look at, you know, the optimal dose that actually has clinical efficacy without causing uh, impairment uh, and driving restriction. Um, and I guess the research on CBD, given its non-intoxicating properties, uh, is a priority. Um, happy to uh, discuss this uh, later. Um, I just want to acknowledge the people who actually done the work. So Anastasia Suarev is a um, PhD student who's been involved in CanSleep. My colleague, Camilla Hoyos, who's a postdoc in our center, has been running a number of cannabinoid studies. And none of this would happen without Ian McGregor, who's the director of the Lambert Institute and other people um, who've mentioned there and the support of the NHMRC and the Lambert Initiative and, and, and BODA now uh, as a company supporting the CANREST study. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk. It was, it was really interesting. Um, we're already getting lots of questions and things through, uh, I can see. So keep on um, sending those through and, and we'll, we'll keep hold of them until the end, if that's okay with everyone. And, and then we'll sort of pose them um, to the group. So um, yeah, Dr. Walsh, would you be happy to sort of um, get your slides ready and then, um, and then we'll get going. So th thanks very much, everyone, for the opportunity to present um, this data. Um, as Ron uh, indicated, this is the, the first uh, randomised double-blind placebo crossover trial looking at using a, a cannabinoid for treating insomnia symptoms. Uh, this was done, obviously, um, with a large team, as you can see, acknowledged here. Uh, but also uh, with considerable help from the support, uh, sort of from the sponsor, which is uh, Zalira, Zalira Therapeutics. So although Zalira sponsored this trial, they didn't have any input into the design, the conduct of the study, including the analyses. Uh, so it was all independent of them. So we know that chronic insomnia is a prevalent condition. Uh, with significant detrimental short and long-term health uh, and quality of life outcomes. Cognitive behavioural therapy for insomnia is the first line or gold standard treatment for insomnia. It's, it is very effective, but for various reasons, it's not readily accept, uh, accessible to everyone who needs it. Therefore, pharmacological therapies um, are often sought and prescribed. Uh, but we know that they often have undesirable side effects, such as daytime sedation, dependence and potential for abuse. So these uh, side effects might preclude use in, in some patients. Cannabis has been proposed as a possible alternative, although as Ron highlighted, uh, there have been few studies which have examined the efficacy of any cannabinoid formulation in treating insomnia. So the aim of this study, the primary aim was to evaluate the safety and efficacy of ZTL101 for improving insomnia symptoms in people with chronic insomnia, as well as evaluating its efficacy for improving self-reported and objective sleep quality and quantity. 
It was a randomised double-blind placebo-controlled crossover design. Patients underwent two weeks of a baseline period, as well as two weeks taking each of the active and placebo medications, and they were separated by a one-week washout period. And uh, during the two weeks, they also uh, it completed uh, actigraphy or wore an actigraph and uh, completed um, sleep diaries. And on the 14th night of each arm or each time point uh, in lab PSG was conducted. Following the main study, all of the participants were invited to attend a further single night of pharmacokinetic testing, where the sampling occurred at two hour time points for 12 hours following ingestion of the study medication. Uh, and as I said, this was actually done overnight uh, following a um, standardised high fat meal. We recruited participants via advertisement, which um, was calling for volunteers to test a new medication to improve sleep quality. And it was only after they expressed an interest to participate that they were told that the medication was medicinal cannabis. ZTL101 is predominantly a, a THC based product. So 20 milligrams per mil THC with uh, some cannabinol and cannabidiol. Um, and there were also naturally occurring terpenes and um, a pharmaceutical grade sunflower oil was the diluent. And then to match the ZTL101 as closely as possible for smell, taste and colour, the placebo was derived from the same cannabis plant. So it contained the same terpenes, uh, but the cannabinoids were removed. Participants were able to take a a 0.5 mil dose, so a single dose, um, they were asked to take it sublingually an hour before they were um, wanting to go to sleep. Uh, but they were allowed to double the dose from the fourth night of each study arm and they were contacted regularly to um, monitor any adverse events. People uh, were in, eligible for inclusion if they were aged between 25 and 70 and if they had uh, chronic insomnia symptoms, with such, um, which was defined as a self-reported difficulty, uh, either falling asleep or staying asleep, so greater than 30 minutes uh, either trying to get to sleep or they were awake for more than 30 minutes overnight uh, for at least three months, uh, at least three or more times a week as well as a, we required an insomnia severity index score greater than 10. Um, the, the ISI is a, a seven um, item questionnaire with a, a total score of, of, or a maximum score of 28. Um, the, they were excluded if they were taking any medications which influence sleep or wake or anything that might interact with the, the study medication. If they were otherwise unhealthy, you know, with significant um, comorbid conditions uh, or whether they had some significant other sleep disorders or were participating in a behavioural therapy program for their insomnia. The primary endpoint uh, included, well, were, they were the safety of the, the investigational product um, and insomnia symptoms, so based on that ISI. And secondary endpoints were self-reported perceptions of sleep onset latency, so the time taken to fall asleep, the total sleep time, so the total amount of time that they thought they slept overnight, as well as the wake time after sleep onset. So how much time during the night after falling asleep did they think they were awake? And we also measured uh, these same variables with actigraphy and polysomnography. So of 167 potential participants who were assessed for eligibility, there were 41 who proceeded to screening and consent. 37 underwent baseline assessment of, from which there were 24, which was our target sample size randomized. One participant withdrew due to uh, non-serious adverse events uh, following night four of the active medication, which meant that 23 participants completed the full protocol. Of those, there were 19 female and uh, five of them were, were postmenopausal, or sorry, most of them were postmenopausal. Um, and uh, they were middle-aged and in a healthy weight range. There were no serious adverse events reported during the trial. 
Uh, there were 36 non-serious adverse events from 17 participants whilst taking the active medication and four non-serious adverse events whilst taking the placebo. However, in all cases, these adverse events were mild, uh, most commonly dry mouth, headache, dizziness. And in all but one case, they had resolved either upon waking in the morning or soon after. Um, so, yeah, compared to the significant side effects that are associated with, with many other hypnotics, um, these data uh, indicate that Z0101 has a, a relatively good short-term safety profile. The insomnia symptoms significantly improved following the two weeks of therapy relative to placebo um, and baseline for the group overall. The magnitude of change in ISI was 5.1. So this didn't quite reach our a priori threshold for clinical significance, which was six. However, the magnitude of the treatment effect was large and uh, it's certainly encouraging uh, in this short-term preliminary trial. Um, the individual data shows that uh, an improvement in ISI um, whilst taking the, the active medication you know, was obvious in, in most people, uh, although not all. Unfortunately, the analyses that we've done so far hasn't identified why some people responded and others didn't. Uh, but we are still trawling through the, the bucket loads of data. Uh, relative to placebo, ZTL101 significantly decreased self-reported measures of sleep onset latency and increased the total sleep time and as well as a subjective measure of sleep quality and feeling rested on wakening. And encouragingly, these results do align with the actigraphy-based increases in total sleep time of 33 minutes sleep efficiency uh, by 3% and a decrease in WASO by all the wake times after sleep onset uh, by 10 minutes. The um, actigraphy based measures of sleep onset latency were unchanged with the active medication, which given our understanding of the limitations of um, the actigraphy derived measurements of sleep latency, as well as the very low sleep latency in all conditions is, is not really surprising. There were no differences in the PSG variables relating to sleep quality, quantity or architecture. So the, the, num, the amount of time people spent in each of the sleep stages that Ron talked about, um, which isn't entirely unexpected due to our understanding of the, the limitations of using a single night of polysomnography to quantify sleep in an insomnia population that people with insomnia do find it difficult to sleep uh, in a sleep lab, or they might have um, paradoxical good sleep in the sleep laboratory. Uh, the pharmacokinetic data, you can see, as I mentioned, this was done uh, following that standardized high fat meal in the evening. The, we can see for the, this is the, the mean plasma concentrations for the, the CBD, THC, CBN, and carboxy THC over a 12-hour period. And um, for people who were taking a single dose, and there were nine people that came back for that, um, that study, and then of those, a further two, two of them came back for a, a night whilst they took the double dose. We can see that the uh, peak concentration occurred approximately four to six hours post-ingestion. Uh, regardless of the, the dose level, um, it was, uh, so regardless of the dose, the level was less than uh, five nanograms per mil by, by 10 hours after ingestion. Um, the, the, and the, the THC, um, that five nanograms per mil is the legal limit for um, driving in Colorado, Washington and Montana, I believe. I'm not sure what it is in the UK. Um, and so in conclusion, ZTL101, which has actually, it's been released on the Australian market as Xenobol, when used in individuals with chronic insomnia symptoms is well tolerated uh, with a good safety profile. And we can confidently say that it, in this population, it did improve the insomnia symptoms and self-reported and some objective measures of sleep uh, quality and quantity as well. So these improvements uh, we think are encouraging and support further investigation of this formulation for the treatment of insomnia.
And I'm going to quickly mention another trial that we're currently doing. Um, this one is looking at a combination of dronabinol and acetazolamide on the treatment or for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea is a prevalent condition and I mean, the, the prevalence data ranges from about 3% up to about 80%. Uh, but I think, you know, we can probably safely say that about 50% of the middle-aged population have obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, the pathogenesis of OSA is thought to relate to uh, four key endotypic traits. So all patients will have some level of anatomical compromise that will make their pharyngeal airway prone to, to collapse during sleep. However, there are other uh, non-anatomical endotypes which are likely to contribute, including the way the muscles respond uh, to uh, increases in ventilatory drive. So that's the muscle responsiveness, uh, how sensitive the, the chemoreflex feedback loop is. So this is the, the oversensitive ventilatory control system, as well as arousal threshold. So this is the, the, the uh, I guess, a, a lower arousal threshold an individual has the more readily they're able to arouse with increases in ventilatory drive. So of the treatments that are for obstructive sleep apnea that are currently available, we know that CPAP acts on all of these traits. We know that upper airway nerve stimulation can target the anatomy and to a degree the muscle responsiveness. And uh, we know that surgery and oral appliances target the anatomy also. Oxygen therapy and acetazol uh, acetazolamide can decrease sensitivity of the ventilatory control system and hypnotics increase the arousal threshold. And um, preclinical data suggests that dronabinol may assist with dilator muscle function as well as the respiratory stability and uh, possibly also arousal threshold. So this has prompted, uh, I guess, a number of a, a number, well, a, a couple of studies uh, with the use of dronabinol, and Ron has uh, spoken briefly about these. So there was a study um, uh, published almost a decade ago now, which involved uh, thirteen moderate to severe sleep at, patients with sleep apnea. It was a three week single arm dose es escalation study. And they, they, they showed a, a reasonable improvement um, of a 32% reduction in AHI. A subsequent study, which was the randomized control trial, uh, a six week parallel group design, uh, there was a, a significant dose dependent decrease in AHI relative to placebo. However, as Ron mentioned, uh, there was a quite a significant difference or baseline difference. So therefore, the, the, the reduction in uh, OSA severity in those people whilst taking dronabinol wasn't actually that great. However, when compared to, to base, the baseline group, which increased, uh, there was a significant reduction. So in response to uh, these results, a number of states in the US included um, dronabinol as uh, a drug that could be used as a treatment for the for obstructive sleep apnea. However, as Ron also said, um, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine have cautioned about its use with the limited evidence. But uh, we, or, or, sorry, also with acetazolamide, uh, we know that this improves um, the severity of obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, this is just one study where there was a, a reduction and you can see of um, OSA severity uh, in the, 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 I guess, the main group average, um, there was a reduction whilst using a 500 milligrams of acetazolamide daily. So this was for one week. And this is just one of a number of studies which have looked at the at use of acetazolamide. Um, and a meta-analysis has demonstrated I think it was 13 studies that there is a, on average a 37% reduction in OSA severity. Um, and it is likely that this is, I guess, largely because it uh, attenuates the ventilatory response to arousal as well as this, this loop gain, which is the, the sensitivity of the respiratory control system. 
So it's possible um, that a combination of both dronabinol and acetazolamide at low to medium doses may be as effective as standard dosing of the individual drugs, uh, but perhaps may uh, reduce side effects if they uh, then compare, I guess, compared to uh, the individual drugs when used at higher doses. So that brings us to the study which was developed by Incanix uh, Healthcare Limited. Um, and they, have, they were looking to, or are looking to evaluate the effect of one week of this combination, dronabinol and acetazolamide, at three different doses compared to placebo on OSA severity. The study design is a randomised crossover, double blind. There's three treatment doses and a placebo, and there's a one week washout between treatment arms. The study is currently underway, so I can't give you any data, uh, but yeah, it would be, it, watch this space. In the, in the next few months, we, there'll be something uh, released with, with information on the outcomes. Um, and I won't actually, the eligibility, this is the eligibility criteria, but predominantly people just need to be otherwise healthy with, but with obstructive sleep apnea. And like Ron, this work is done with a whole group of people, including uh, physiologists, physicians, uh, psychologists, statisticians, and our sleep scientists, as well as our participants. And uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the sponsors, Zillera Therapeutics and Incanix Healthcare. So thank you. Fantastic. That was really interesting. Thank you so much for that. And um, yeah, it was really, particularly sort of your ongoing trial now in obstructive sleep apnea as well. We look forward to... Um, seeing lots more research outcomes from uh, from you in 2022. Um, and with that, um, we'd just like to pass on to Dr. Mark Weatherall now to give his uh, the third and final talk of this uh, of this session, and then we'll uh, open up for questions. So yes, obviously, yes. I really thank you very much indeed uh, for asking me to join this panel, and I do. I feel very daunted to uh, be sharing the stage with, um, uh, you know, two, you know, sort of world stars in this area and, and um, really interesting to hear uh, what they've had to say and really important to try and provide a, a, a really solid evidence base for the use of uh, medicinal cannabis products for sleep disorders. Um, uh, I'm very briefly just going to sort of share the, some of the experience that we've had at Sapphire with treating patients with insomnia. Uh, this is really the background uh, that I had when I came into this. Um, and, and obviously, um, you know, throughout the sort of historical literature on medical cannabis, as far back as uh, O'Shaughnessy's uh, original pamphlet from the 1840s, there are mentions of the sort of hypnogenic effects of, of cannabis. And if you kind of look at the 19th century uh, literature, there's uh, a lot of mention of cannabis being a useful drug for sleep. Um, even uh, Russell Reynolds, who was a uh, Queen Victoria's physician, and, uh, and John Bradbury, who's the uh, Downing Professor of Medicine in Cambridge, um, sort of recommended this and were interested in this. And uh, there was quite a lot of research, early research, in terms of the um, sort of fractionation of cannabis and the, trying to determine the active uh, products in cannabis uh, that went on in, uh, in Cambridge, in particular in the 1890s. Obviously, uh, following the uh, sort of prohibition of cannabis in the sort of uh, mid 20th century, um, things uh, disappeared and really it's not until the 1970s that we started to sort of see early studies on the effects of cannabis on sleep, the fact that it potentially could reduce sleep onset latency uh, and so on. And obviously, as, as Ron and Jennifer have said, the quality of these studies really, um, you know, has, has not really been great. But there's been a steady um, stream of, uh, of those and, and the, the results seem to be have seemed to have been fairly consistent across them. And certainly, if you look at um, surveys of uh, people with neurological disorders like epilepsy and MS, um, again, fairly consistently across those disorders, a lot of those patients will say that one of the main benefits of cannabis or cannabis, medicinal cannabis products, is improvement of sleep and thereby of quality of life generally. So obviously at Sapphire, um, we're in the business of uh, treating patients, but also collecting clinical data to provide a real world evidence platform. Um, and we ask our patients to, to complete questionnaires uh, prior to consultation and then on an ongoing basis while they're receiving treatment. Obviously, that data is augmented by the notes that we as clinicians take. 
Um, and, um, uh, you know, the idea of this is that um, this, again, should provide a, a real world basis uh, of, of evidence. Yes, it's not, uh, you know, a randomized placebo controlled um, clinical trial, uh, but it is important to understand um, what these treatments can do and, again, provide input and information at that level. So there is a standardized protocol of demographics with the health information uh, and the prescriptions. And then we use validated uh, patient reported outcome measures. Um, uh, some of these are general. So uh, we use sort of general, you know, health related quality of life, anxiety. Uh, we ask all our patients about sleep. Um, and then there's a series of condition specific uh, validated questionnaires for particular conditions. The sleep um, uh, question is actually a very straightforward one. This is the sleep quality scale, which is a, uh, a validated um, uh, scale developed by the uh, Canadians. Um, and it's a simple um, uh, scale, 0 to 10, just of the patient's um, rating of their sleep quality overall. Uh, and obviously, the lower the number, the worse the uh, sleep quality is. Um, this is a, a sort of overall view of the sort of patients that we've been treating uh, at Sapphire that have gone into the registry. And, and obviously on the left hand side, you've got the sort of the higher numbers of patients with chronic pain, neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia, anxiety and so on. On the right hand side, you've got the smaller the numbers and overall about one and a half percent of the patients that we've seen have presented with insomnia as their primary uh, problem. And this is uh, data from uh, Simon's uh, analysis of the uh, registry as, as a whole, um, uh, which um, has um, recently uh, been uh, accepted for uh, publication in uh, cannabis and cannabinoid research. And um, I haven't shown you the, 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 uh, the scales for um, anxiety, uh, quality of life and, and so on, but I mean, there are significant, uh, statistically significant and clinically significant improvements in those areas. And then um, a significant improvement in self-reported sleep quality using the sleep quality scale. So this is across the whole of the population uh, that we treat um, uh, over um, uh, three to six months. Um, and again, just, just very briefly, just mentioning the adverse of events that are recorded across the uh, population as a whole. Uh, somnolence is certainly one of the more common events, although at, at a pretty low level, really only about 3% of the patients um, have reported that uh, and uh, only really in a couple of cases was it um, uh, reported as a severe uh, adverse event. So um, I've been working with Sapphire since the uh, beginning for the last couple of years now and um, uh, I, the neurology patients, uh, many of them get uh, filtered uh, my way um, and uh, looking back at the patients that I've seen, about 10% of those again have, have presented with insomnia as their primary problem. Um, uh, I pulled out 21 of these patients, uh, and two thirds of them were men, which, uh, which is obviously a slightly different population from the trial population that, uh, that Jennifer presented. Um, and they range in age between uh, 19 and, and the mid 60s. Um, about half of these patients uh, presented mainly with the difficulty initiating sleep. Um, uh, and about a quarter had sort of fleet, uh, difficulty staying asleep, so sleep fragmentation or frequent waking, and about a quarter of them uh, reported both uh, problems. Most of them had previously used cannabis or medicinal cannabis products to aid sleep, though not all of them were currently doing so. Two of the patients didn't proceed with treatment, but of the patients who did, um, six patients um, used oils alone, either just a, a, a broad spectrum THC product or a combination of broad spectrum THC and CBD products. Uh, four patients um, used a mixture of oils and floss and nine patients just used uh, floss and um, uh, these were um, uh, universally uh, THC predominant, approximately 20 to 22 um, percent uh, indica or a hybrid um, floss. And these were the, uh, the, the SQS scores, uh, sleep quality scores, just from baseline to, to three months. Um, and as you'll see in, in the population, there was a, a general you know, improvement, a general upward trend um, uh, for uh, the patients for whom we have um, recorded uh, numbers. So overall, these insomnia patients um, did uh, tend to report um, an, an improvement. Um, although the uh, degree of improvement was in, in some cases relatively uh, mild. 
some of the patients um, who had only very modest improvements may have uh, been currently using um, uh, non-prescribed cannabis products and switched over to uh, prescribed cannabis. So there may have been not so much of an improvement as some of the patients who were cannabis naive. So these are the sorts of people that, that we've been treating. Um, this is, uh, uh, this is um, uh, uh, um, uh, Carl, who's a 50 year old man. He was a jeweler and um, long standing, decades long, really difficult to initiate in sleep, um, as, well as, um, uh, as well as frequent waking, fragmented and unrefreshing sleep. Uh, over the years, this problem had become complicated by uh, increasing amounts of anxiety about the fact that he couldn't sleep. Um, and the effect on his ability to work. Um, he had tried multiple prescribed medications, including hypnotics such as Zopiclone and Zolpidem, as well as benzodiazepines. He'd had low dose metazapine, he'd been given amitriptyline. He had meticulously followed sleep hygiene, uh, and none of these really had been helpful. He had used cannabis to help him sleep in the past, though, was not doing so um, routinely. He had a history of um, uh, prostatic um, uh, hypertrophy, which caused him a small degree of nocturia, as well as some back pain, probably relating to years of, um, uh, uh, of meticulous, um, highly detailed work as a jeweler, uh, and that modest low mood. He uh, started on uh, THC oils and uh, also uh, used um, uh, a, um, a THC uh, predominant floss to vape um, uh, at intervals during the day. Uh, the floss was helpful for the back pain and the oil and the floss had a very marked improvement uh, on his sleep time and quality and a sort of consequent knock on effect on reduction of anxiety. And he reported when we saw him again that um, actually it had, a, it had um, you know, functionally uh, been extremely helpful as he'd actually managed to increase the amount of time he could work from no more than three or four hours per day to up to a sort of full day of eight or nine hours. Um, and um, this was um, uh, improvement was um, uh, reflected in the uh, in the improvement in his uh, SQS rating. Um, the knock on effect on other conditions of improved sleep, I think, is really is one of the real benefits that I see. And I think that a lot of the sort of patients with coexisting neurological disorders. Um, this was uh, Stuart, who's a 29 year old. Um, so he, uh, since he was 14, he suffered with quite significant anxiety and he also had a movement disorder, which is paroxysmal kinesogenic dyskinesia. I'm sure most of you will never have heard of this uh, of PKD, but it's basically a, a disorder where if people move quickly or they're startled, they then get uh, uncontrollable movements, usually down one side of the body. Um, this was associated with a tendency to more generalised muscle jerking. Um, and also um, a tendency, a sort of latent tendency to, to quite bad hip knee jerks. The standard treatment for uh, PKD is, is carbamazepine, is Tegretol. Um, but unfortunately, when he took that, it actually um, made his sleep worse and causing quite significant hip knee jerks, which prevented him from falling asleep. Uh, and, and then he became, again, very anxious about the fact that he couldn't sleep properly. He was given baclofen and tizanidine to see if that would help with the jerking, but it didn't. Occasionally, he would take a clonazepam or zopiclone for sleep initiation, but he rarely found this particularly helpful. And he was somebody that had never used uh, cannabis or medicinal cannabis products. He had been investigated um, for his sleep in the past and been found to have very mild obstructive sleep apnea and, and had a mandibular advancement uh, device, but um, that seemed to be pretty well controlled. So we gave him a, a combination of a small dose of uh, CBD and, and THC, which he took about an hour before bed. And this had a, 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 an excellent effect. Um, uh, it improved his sleep initiation. It seemed to settle his hypnotic jerks down almost completely. In fact, to a point where he was able to recommence carbamazepine without it interfering with either sleep or hypnotic jerks. And so he was able then, uh, because the sleep was better, to tolerate a medication that then was able to treat and improve his PKD. Uh, I'm very happy with that. The, the third case, again, is, is another good example of the kind of knock-on effects of sleep improvement on other conditions. Uh, this is uh, Bob, who was a 64-year-old man um, with chronic lower back pain following a discectomy in 2012. Uh, and he'd had multiple medications and localized interventions, which hadn't really been very helpful. 
In addition to this, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's uh, in 2019, and he was on standard dopamine replacement therapy, Madapar. Um, uh, and alongside this, he'd, he'd also been somebody that had had long-standing uh, difficulty initiating sleep, um, which had been exacerbated by pain and anxiety. Um, complicated past history of irritable bowel syndrome due to an ulceration asthma, and again, cannabis naive. Um, he um, went on to a, a slightly higher dose of THC, about 10 milligrams in the evening, was alongside some CBD. And, and, and I think he probably was the single person that I've, we've, I've, I've seen that, that was happiest with the effects of this treatment. He was absolutely delighted because it did improve his pain, it reduced his anxiety, and his sleep quality and quantity uh, were um, hugely better. And, and this then actually had a knock-on effect on his Parkinson's. Um, so there isn't really good evidence that um, uh, medicinal cannabis can help Parkinson's per se. It's a slightly controversial area, but there's certainly no good you know, quality clinical trial evidence of that. But this patient very definitely felt that the fact that he was sleeping better, had less pain, was improved his Parkinson's. And, and I think, again, this is quite a common thing across the board that if other problems are improved, then people's neurological conditions, Parkinson's, MS, uh, epilepsy, headache disorders uh, can improve. So in conclusion, what, what, have I, what do I think I've learned over the last couple of years about medicinal cannabis and sleep? I, I think we see an awful lot of patients, both with and without neurological disorders, who have a triad of pain, anxiety, and poor sleep quality. And medicinal cannabis, I think, uh, proves to be often very helpful uh, for these types of problems. I think it's clear to me that, uh, you know, that medicinal cannabis uh, can improve both sleep initiation and help with sleep maintenance. And I think that, um, I mean, the, the, the graph that I've shown in the corner here, this was a, from a, a few patients in the cannabis um, uh, um, uh, cancer, for cancer pain study, just looking at the, um, uh, the peak concentration timings for THC and its metabolites. And I think, you know, very similar um, findings to the ones that Jennifer um, uh, showed. And I think, um, you, you know, the fact that uh, peak concentrations of the, of the active metabolites sort of come at about two or three hours, but take quite a, got a reasonable half-life, makes it a useful drug for sleep maintenance. And I think, you know, this is, this is the real lacoon in, in the sort of standard treatments we have. You know, many people will respond well to hypnotics, um, but sleep maintenance is much more difficult to medicate. And so I think this is, personally, I think this is an area of which could be of real interest and real use. Um, I, the, the general feedback is that THC predominant regimes with potentially with indica or high restraint are very likely to be useful. Um, and um, certainly it seems to be that the medicinal cannabis is probably perhaps less likely than standard hypnotics to cause hangover effects the next day. Um, I now tell patients to experiment with timings, probably dosing around about 60 to 90 minutes before bed uh, for sleep initiation, and then possibly a small second dose just at bedtime um, to a sleep maintenance. And, and as I've said, we do see somnolence as a side effect of medicinal cannabis, but it's rarely problematic. And um, that, again, is encouraging. So there we go. Um, thank you. Didn't even mention the cricket. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we've had a we've had a question about the cricket, but I think we'll probably try and steer away from it just so that we don't cause any sort of diplomatic row uh, at this time. So um, we've only got five minutes, so um, I'll try and keep the, the questions as relevant as possible um, for the entire audience and brief. Um, we've talked a lot about the sort of burgeoning evidence of medical cannabis and it's it's a it's definitely a growing field so there's definitely more research to be done but in terms of clinical practice where do you see it fitting along the spectrum from conservative treatment pharmacological treatments non-pharmacological treatments where do you think it sits from that considering you know you can't make a recommendation for everybody you know everyone's different but where do you think it sits within that mark perhaps as you're currently using it in your clinical practice where do you think it sits yeah, I mean, obviously, in the UK, medicinal cannabis, um, uh, for the vast majority of indications, is not a licensed product. And therefore, you know, we are in, um, uh, you know, we're in um, the business of, you know, making sure that the patients that we prescribe for have 
um, you know, had access to and, and tried, you know, standard therapy. So I think, you know, I think one would expect, you know, when talking to people about the use of medicinal cannabis, you know, that if, if people too have, you know, looked at and tried standard therapy. So I think, you know, uh, behavioral therapy, you know, behavioral modification, sleep hygiene uh, is incredibly important. And obviously for sleep initiation, you know, um, hypnotics and other drugs can be helpful, but again, you know, the, 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 their use is limited by tolerability and time and so on. So I think, you know, there's, the, the, uh, I, I, you know, in a lot of these areas that we treat, I think medicinal cannabis may come over time to be, you know, more widely used. And of course, um, you know, the sort of work that, that Ron and, and Jennifer are doing to provide a solid evidence base and potentially specific, you know, products with that evidence based, I think will make a huge difference. And, and I, you know, I think it's inevitable that over time, we're, these are going to become increasingly part of the sort of more standard pharmacopoeia for um, dealing with sleep disorders. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. Um, Ron, how about how about for yourself? Where do you see see it currently? But well, you're currently on mute, Ron. Sorry. Yeah. So, I guess in our our clinics, it's not part of the current sort of prescription. But there are obviously, as I showed you, quite a lot of prescriptions out there for um, you know, cannabinoids in the space of insomnia. So um, the the problem, uh, I guess, is that, yeah, I mean, we, we need to get the evidence base a bit, bit stronger. I know that comes not just from, from us, but from the regulatory authorities and so forth. I think the other thing is that insomnia has been a bit of a Cinderella condition. So, you know, people have not often not taken it seriously or except the, you know, the people who've got it, you know, <laughs> they take it seriously. And the other thing is that there are a number of treatments which are coming out where you've got to, you know, compare what the value is. I think there was a question related to CBT and that's being delivered either face-to-face -face or, or through these digital programs or, you know, we've been working with digital sort of apps of insomnia and they can be quite useful and then now you've got a whole shift away from benzodiazepines with the class of orexin antagonists which uh you know at the moment are a bit in at least in australia are a bit expensive but they seem to meet the criteria of a you know better quality insomnia medication so you know you've got to there, will, there needs to be comparative effectiveness studies down the track yeah Perfect, thank you. And 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 Jen, how about for yourself? Yeah, you well, look, I'm I'm yeah, I'm not a clinician, so uh, I'm a I'm a physiologist. Um, but I, I I agree with with Ron and Mark. I think that the evidence isn't isn't there for um, uh, the, uh, yeah for convincing use. I guess um, as a first line therapy. Um, I, and I, in addition to the issues that Ron's mentioned. You know this um, individual variability, uh, and you know so many other factors that can influence the the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of you know cannabinoids um, is is you know potentially I guess it, it needs to be unravelled a little a little more I think um, before we can you know give someone a sort of one size fits all treatment for a you know particular condition perfect and um we'll, we'll go for one final question just because we've had lots of interest on it in terms of the chat is um around terpenes and other minor components within uh cannabis-based medicinal products what are your views around uh the current evidence of their effectiveness current uh, as things stand um why don't we get we go in reverse order this time? So Jen, if you want to to take that, yeah. First. Um, so I, I think it's a really important question. I think that it's one of those other factors that we really need to understand more about. Um, you know, this there's, there's a just I mean infinite um, formulations and that that you know we we need to study really. Um, but at this point, I guess most people are, are focusing on the. The major cannabinoids. Um, some people are looking at 
terpenes, but um, there's not really that much evidence with terpenes, you know, in in terms of clinical data. So yeah, I think we we still need more. <laughs> and and Ron, I might flick past to Mark because uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not a psychopharmacologist. I mean, you know, I think I just support that. You know, we 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 kind of like. Uh, you know, we people come to us with things that they want to test, and we kind of design studies. and And uh, you know, I work with psychopharmacologists who kind of understand these issues better. But when I see the number of varieties of cannabinoids, you kind of like, um, yeah, it's daunting. It's exciting as well, Ron. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, mean, I, yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. It is exciting, isn't it? And, and um, you know, the Israelis um, sort of have the, this sort of notion of the entourage effect that um, uh, each bit of the cannabis, uh, each of the sort of biologically active bits of cannabis work better in the context of all the other bits, which kind of makes sense from an evolutionary point of view. Um, and, um, and I think, I'm sure, I'm sure we're going to find that, you know, um, that some of the terpenes are, you know, helpful and important in this, um, you know, pinene or myrcene or, you know, whichever ones, uh, you know, and that, and that will come through. And again, that's going to be, that's going to be all about, you know, um, uh, you know, research, both, you know, um, uh, you know, basic, uh, basic science research and, and, you know, and clinical research. So, you know, uh, we just need, we need more data. Uh, we always need more data, but um, it will come over time, I'm sure. And it will be exciting. Perfect. Well, I just want to thank uh, all three of you for uh, your really fascinating talks. Uh, I think this has been one of the most uh, interesting webinars that we've had in some time. So, so thank you all very much for giving up your time to speak today. Uh, also want to thank everyone for, for joining us, whether it's early in the morning or later on in the day. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. And, and finally, uh, a big thank you to our partners, the International Sleep Charity, uh, for helping to put this together and and also the amazing what they're doing to sort of advocate for the improvement of, of sleep uh, globally. Ron alluded to the fact that insomnia and is sort of this, this Cinderella condition and I think the work that they're doing to advocate for better research in this field is obviously an important one so uh, yeah we'd just like to thank them for that as well so um so, yeah, so thanks everyone. Um, I think we're going to leave it there. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll have some webinars and things uh, in the new year and we, we look forward to seeing you then. Perfect. Thank thanks you. all. Thank you. Thanks.